evening members and welcome to this meeting of the Overview Scrutiny Committee. This is an extra meeting. Um, thank you all for attending and we do have a number of people attending via Zoom as well. Uh, if I can first of all, before we start the business of the meeting, read the webcast announcement. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of subsequent repeated viewing with copies of the recording being made available for those that request it. By being present at this meeting, it is likely that recording cameras will capture your image and this will result in your image becoming part of the broadcast. You should be aware that this may infringe your human and data protection rights and if you have any concerns, then please speak to the webcasting officer. And can I also remind members and officers to activate your microphones before speaking, but also to turn them off when you have finished speaking. Thank you. Uh, apologies for absence. Chairman, I've received apologies from councillors Baldwin, Hadley, Stalker and Plummer. Thank you. And any substitute members? Um, Chairman, I've heard substitute, um, Councillor Bassett is substituting for Councillor Hadley and Councillor Stocker is substituting for Councillor Stalker. Thank you very much. And if we move on to the minutes of the last meeting to confirm the minutes of the 18th of November. Anybody got any comments first of all? No, so you're happy to confirm those meetings? <laughs> Thank you. Any declarations of interest? <coughs> no. And uh, public questions or requests to address the Overview and Scrutiny Committee? None, Chairman. Thank you very much. So uh, we now come on to item seven on the agenda. Before we start on that, I will just uh, remind members, or perhaps some of you hadn't picked up, the fact that the uh, proposed Epping Forest District Market Policy, item eight, has been uh, withdrawn for this evening's meeting. Uh, there is more work to be done on it, but it will be coming back to a later meeting. So we have only got the one item this evening, which is the Princess Alexandra Hospital, progress on development of the new hospital and the CQC report. And the item is on page 13 of the agenda. Um, we have got with us this evening um, from Princess Alexander, we have Lance McCarthy, who is the Chief Executive Officer, S uh, Stephanie Lawton, the Chief Operating Officer, uh, Michael Meredith, the Director of Strategy, and Jill Hogan, who is the, the new, when I say the new hospital, I mean the new hospital uh, communication officer, not somebody who's just come into the job of that position. Um, so welcome to all of you this evening and thank you very much for attending. Uh, the recommendation that we have is that the committee undertake appropriate external scrutiny of the development of a new hospital in Shearing by the Princess Alexandra Hospital Trust and also the CQC report. Uh, which was recently published. Um, if I could perhaps, um, Lance, are you going to lead us off on this or at least introduce and start us off? I don't know whether you're going to take it in two parts or whether talk to the whole together. Sure, happy to. Thank you very much, Chair. So um, what would you prefer to start with, either the new hospital or the CQC report? Shall we start with the new hospital? On the basis that that one might be, I, I say more straightforward, that's not what I mean, but <laughs> an, an easier <laughs> starting point. Sure, absolutely, we'll do that. Um, we sent some slides through yesterday. Have, have all members got a copy of those or seen those, or should we try and share them on the screen with that help? I think probably we'll have to share them on screen because as far as I'm aware, none of us have received them as slides to look at prior to the meeting. Okay, apologies. Um, okay, we will attempt to um, share them on the screen. So if we uh, do new hospital uh, first, um, introduce uh, Michael Meredith, who's our director of 
uh, strategy in the states and who is leading our uh, new hospital program and uh, and linked in really closely to uh, the national uh, new hospital uh, program team um, and uh, and then Michael can talk you through um, uh, the, the, where we are with the, with the development uh, all the real uh, positives that are happening um, and then also where we are and how we link in uh, with the border uh, border national uh, program so I'll hand over to Michael and then maybe we'll if we go through these slides, Chair, and then uh, stop and we'll take any queries, questions from uh, members, and then, uh, and then we can pick up the CQC report afterwards. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, Lance. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having us here. It's a pleasure to be here to introduce uh, where we're up to with our new hospital. Um, it's not the best of news, uh, but it is uh, definitely some progress, but I'll take you through where we are. So I am Michael Meredith, I'm Director of Strategy and Estates for the Trust, and I am the lead for the new hospital programme. Um, and I've been in the trust for about three years, and this is one of my key projects. So um, we've had a really busy year. We've come a long way in 12 months. Uh, last September, we were concluding our design brief. And since then, we've had an enormous amount of work that's been going on in the new hospital. Uh, we've worked all the way through COVID, uh, and we've been working really hard with all of our clinicians to ensure that we have got uh, the best possible design that we could have for the new hospital. Um, it is, uh, it, we've come a, a, a really long way. Um, you can see what we've delivered so far. So we've completed our design brief. So the design brief for the new hospital is completed. We've run through our demand and capacity analysis. And we've done that right across the system, aligning to our SDP and with other system colleagues, our ICS, I should say, not SDP, our ICS and other system colleagues. So our demand and capacity analysis is complete. That's understanding the future demand for services likely to come to Princess Alex. Um, from that, we developed our new models of care. So how are we going to be delivering care in the future? What will that care look like? How will we transform the care that we deliver? Uh, with a really key focus on early intervention and prevention, working with system partners to um, deliver care close to people's homes. But when people do need to come into the hospital, working really closely um, with our clinicians and with our patients and with their families to ensure that we deliver really high quality care. Uh, once we've understand, understood the demand for our services, we've got our models of care. We then said, well, how does that turn into the rooms that we all need in the new hospital? And that's our schedule of accommodation. So every single room in the hospital has to be designed from the cleaners cupboard through to the through to the emergency theatres through to our emergency department through to each of the individual bedrooms in the brand new hospital all of those rooms have to be designed and that's called our schedule of accommodation now that is also complete um, from our schedule of accommodation you can see the outline here on the right hand side we've now completed what we call our one in 200 drawings so that all of those rooms have now been designed into a building and into a building form um, and that's the walls the doors the windows the corridors and all of the accesses it doesn't go down to the detail of plug sockets desks and chairs but the full design of the hospital is now complete alongside our one in 200 drawings we've also completed our procurement strategy so how will we procure our main contractor in order for us to work with the um, to build the hospital we developed our facilities our facilities management strategy how we move goods in through and through the hospital how we get um, goods into the hospital how we get people and things out of the hospital um, we've completed our digital strategy uh, modern methods of construction strategy, how we will build the hospital using the most modern methods of construction, our net zero carbon strategy, and we plan to be the first all electric hospital in the UK, in the UK. Uh, real high ambitions around our, our net zero carbon strategy, and our communications and engagement strategy as well. So how will we work with our communities, how we work with our people to engage in the development of the brand new hospital. Um, and you'll remember when we spoke to the HOSCs last summer, we had the joint HOSCs, Lance and I, um, both presented to the HOSCs. Um, we promised you that we would have a really wide engagement. Now, we have had a really wide engagement. Um, we've been working with our system and our clinical partners to ensure that we've got the right clinical strategy designed. And we have really engaged widely around our clinical strategy. But we've also engaged with a number of, with, with the communities as well. We've had 70 plus stakeholder meetings um, across the system. Uh, we had two uh, events with over 200 people attending each of those events. We've had 125,000 views on social media and over 500 responses to our events. And our events um, uh, were rated by the people that attended as 95% people rated it excellent or, or above. So really, really good public engagement. We know there's a lot more to be done, but I'll come on to that in a minute as we start talking through where we've actually got to. So as I said before, we've got everything in place. We're ready to go as an organization. Uh, we've got our clinical model, new ways of working, one in 200 drawings agreed, 
Um, we've got our planning agreement agreed with the local authority. Thank you very much for everyone that's been working with us. Um, uh, and our OBC, that's our outline business case. And the outline business case is the key document that we have to develop in order to release the funding is 60% drafted. Um, alongside that, we've also launched PHT 2030, which is our new strategy. However, and there's always a but, isn't there, in these things, we are part of what's called the New Hospital Programme. It's a major national programme of 40 plus new hospitals to be built um, in the next 20 or 30 years. Um, we are one of the front running hospitals, we're one of the front running eight, often called the Pathfinders, now called Wave 3, and I just heard maybe called uh, something different going forward, but we are one of the front running eight hospitals. Um, as part of that, all front running eight hospitals have been asked to slow down uh, to complete what's called a design convergence review. The design convergence review is a review of those eight hospitals to ensure that the national programme maximises the benefit of the investment in the hospitals in the new hospital programme. That means that we have to align Thing, common areas of design, for example, ensuring that we have uh, the single rooms are designed, so all of our bedrooms are designed the same, to make sure that we use similar types of construction, to make sure that we work with the supply chain effectively, to ensure that we maximise the benefit of all those hospitals. And that's been driven by the national programme. That was expected to be released in December this year. However, there has been a delay to that, and it's not likely to be released until the new year. So we cannot continue to design our hospital any further until that design convergence review process has been completed. So we're waiting for that national programme to complete. Um, it is the right thing to do. Um, the design convergence review will be looking at maximising the benefit for more hospitals than just ours, so it is the right thing to do. However, it does mean that there is a delay to our programme. We cannot progress our programme until, that, until that's ready. Um, we're also working to finalise our land purchase. We've agreed a price with our uh, with the land agents. Uh, we're just working through the finer details of the uh, of the um, contract with them. And we have been working very closely with Essex County Council to ensure that we're aligned with all of the enabling works and the uh, road improvement that's happening uh, up by junction, um, by the new junction of the M11. Oh, excuse me. Oh, I don't know what's happened there, I beg your pardon. Let me go back into there. I pressed the button rather than clicking my mouse. Sorry, everybody, I don't know what's happened. I'll have to do it out, out of uh, presentation mode. I do, I do, apolo do apologise. So we, we, we are a long way on. We've nearly completed our, our new hospital. As I say, we're waiting for the national programme to align. We're waiting for the funding to flow down from that programme. Uh, but we are continuing to engage. We're just about to release our new hospital website. That's just about to go, to go live. We'll go live uh, in the next couple of weeks. And we've got a lot of internal engagement also going on with our, with our people. Um, we're revisiting our stakeholder and community groups, so we're working really closely with the community groups. We continue to engage with, the, with those groups. It's a really tricky balance for us at the moment. While we're waiting for the new hospital programme and we haven't got certainty around the next steps in the programme, we're just trying to balance off that engagement with, with our communities to ensure that we're engaging on the final design. Um, we don't think it's fair or reasonable to be engaging with people until we're absolutely clear about the next step, the next way forward, and we're not absolutely clear clear at this moment about the, uh, the next way forward. We're very confident that we'll get the funding, but we're still waiting for that final approval, and we won't get that until we've got our OBC approved. Um, we've also been continuing with new councillor briefings, so we've been bringing briefing councillors right across the patch, as there's been many changes right across the patch, and we're now re re revisiting our engagement plan, and in January we will be developing our engagement plan, and finally we'll be developing our transport and our travel strategy, and our consultation It will be in place for that early in the new year, again, as soon as we're clear about our next steps. Um, so um, I apologise that I'm not here today um, announcing that the hospital, when the hospital doors will be open because we're not clear about that at the moment, but I'm more than happy to take any questions that you might have on our development or where we are at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, obviously a lot of information there and as you rightly say, disappointing that we are kind of almost on hold at the moment, I think might be the expression. So, if I can go over to members for any questions, Councillor Murray. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, one question and then uh, a comment, if I may, if I do the question first. Uh, obviously, thank you for that presentation. Uh, I was really pleased to hear about the uh, uh, 
the clinician involvement in the actual design because uh, my experience of design is in the field of education uh, and the people who actually use the buildings are never asked and uh, we can tell from day one that uh, they've not been planned and designed uh, with the users in mind. Uh, I just want to examine that in a little bit more detail. Mm -hmm. how, how far down the actual structure of the workforce did you actually consult? Because I tend to find that the uh, lower down isn't quite the word I want, but the further down you go down the workforce in terms of hierarchy, uh, the more common sense they often talk about <coughs> what may, it, it's just a fair comment, you know, the more sense they talk about day in, day in use, because they're the people who will be doing it. So, uh, you know, how, how, how intensive was the uh, consultation with the, uh, with the future workforce? Thank you, and that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, we need to remember that the hospital will be designed in phases as well. We're at one in 200 drawings, so that's the, the core layout of the building. We will get into more detail as we get into the one in 50 drawings, where we get down to where the plug sockets will be, where the desks will be, where the chairs will be, um, where all the window openings will be, etc., and the final fixtures and fittings and how you'll find your way through the building, etc., wayfinding. Um, so we've engaged really, really widely with our both of our clinic, clinical staff and our non-clinical staff. Um, we, as I mentioned in my presentation, we developed our FM strategy. We included the chefs and we included porters and we included domestic services in the design of those services. And they would be what you'd call our, um, our, our wider workforce. But we've also included our nursing staff, our, our senior clinical staff, so from our consultants all the way through for our senior clinicians. Um, and we've also um, in, uh, included a really wide workforce engagement around our, what we call our allied health professionals. So that is all of the other health professionals that work within that, so physiotherapists, um, as well as working really closely with um, people like our radiologists to ensure that we've got our radiology department designed in the right way. I think where we've been particularly innovative and where we've really tried to think differently is that we've brought people in from outside of the hospital to work with us on the design as well. So we've brought in uh, around our clinical model and our new models of care, we brought in GPs, we brought in mental health professionals, we brought in a range of experts from across the country and across the world actually to help us think through how we might design a, a really innovative uh, clinical model and how we might use technology in a very, very different way in order to deliver healthcare. So we've really engaged quite widely and it's a really good question. I think there's more to do. I think as we get into the finer details of the design, so for example, thinking through how we might clean a room and which materials we might use in a room, how we might use robotics to clean the rooms, uh, et cetera, then we really will need to engage much further with our staff. But the, the plans are there. The plans are there to make that happen. Uh, and once we've completed our OBC, it's about a year away to complete what we call our full business case, our FBC, where you get into the real minutiae detail, working with the designers of the building itself, the people who build the building itself. That's where we'll bring in another wave of our workforce into that design. Thank you. Thank you. And then my comment, Madam Chairman, uh, I, I can make this comment and I realise why the, uh, the, the, the speaker couldn't. I, I think you can be fairly confident about the money uh, and that's for three reasons. One, I think it's a really good scheme. Uh, secondly, I have followed this quite carefully at a national level and you are one of the 40 proposals that actually involves building a new hospital when the government is including large refurbishments and so on. So I think they will want some new hospitals because that's what they're claiming, that the program is 40 new hospitals. We've now found out that it isn't actually 40 new hospitals, but this is one. So I think that's the second reason why I think you can be quite optimistic. And again, all the evidence, and it's been uh, produced by... Uh, uh, by uh, by uh, independent think tanks, a lot of government money follows uh, constituency boundaries. And one of your big strengths, and why I'm almost 100% certain that you will get the funding, is Harlow is a marginal constituency. And that's to our <laughs> benefit, but all the evidence is that that's uh, how money is being distributed at the moment. So 100% confident that you'll get it. And I can give you one other area as well. Um, we have massive stakeholder support. We're one of the few new hospitals in the front runners of the eight hospitals that are being planned that has absolute 100% alignment between all of our major stakeholders. You, you, are, you are one of those, but also all of our political stakeholders as well. Um, and we have had an audience with the Secretary of State for Health, and we have had a conversation about this, and he is supportive of this scheme as well. Um, so it, it, it will come down to Treasury. 
Thank you very much. Thank that. you for your comments. Thank you. Um, just before we move on from those various stakeholders that you consulted, you mentioned various ones during that uh, introduction, uh, or in answer to Councillor Murray's question. Have you been consulting with the ambulance service and how they will access yep. and exit from the, the site? Because having been driving out of PAH recently myself, it's a nightmare with ambulances. <laughs> Yes, thank you. It's another really good question. So yeah, we've been working really closely with all of our major stakeholders. You know, on, on the on the site that we've got at the moment, we also have the mental health service on there as well. So we've been working with those people, with those with those as well. That's EPUT. Um, but the ambulance service, East of England ambulance service. Yeah, absolutely. So I should have mentioned actually. Um, at the, at the currently, we're proposing to have what's called a make ready hub, ambulance hub on the main site. So should we get the funding and should we get the land and should we get the go ahead for the new hospital, there's an expectation there'll be a, a brand new ambulance hub on the same site as well. And they want to co-locate with, co -lo co with the hospital as well. So uh, yes, absolutely, 100% uh, aligned. Um, all hospital design has to have two entrances and exits as well, and those need to, be, need to be safeguarded to allow for blue light entrance and exit, even in the case of an emergency, one of those exits being blocked. We've had really careful planning around blue light um, entrance and exit from the site. But thank you, yep. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Rackham. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for the report. Um, Whips Cross is also in the same situation at the moment, but I know that... Um, there's been some problems around this because of, they haven't increased the number of beds. I wondered going forward if your hospital is looking at keeping the same amount of beds or perhaps um, having an increase. So I'd like okay. to know that. Um, just a couple of other things. Uh, will there be any staff accommodation on site? And um, I wondered as well if uh, what's going to happen with the parking because obviously going forward... We want to bring in less parking, but um, I am conscious that there will be some patients that do need to park, and it is a concern to me going forward, parking. So if you could answer that, please. Okay, thank you. So I'll take those questions in order. So beds, at the moment, we're planning approximately 10% additional beds, all based on our uh, detailed modelling. However, we have allowed for significant increase in the size of the hospital by over 20% additional space that can be easily added on at a later date. So we can add extra space onto the hospital that doesn't have the same impact that we have at our existing hospital, uh, which means, um, so you can add it on without impacting the way the hospital actually works. We call it clinical adjacencies, the right departments of the hospital are next to each other, but fun fundamentally allowing the full function of the hospital with the additional, uh, with the additional capacity. One thing we know for sure is that healthcare will change going forward. So core to our design is that level of flexibility. We might need less beds going forward. We might need more beds, but we've allowed for that. Um, of course, as a fine balance, the more beds you build, the higher the cost of your hospital. So there's always a fine balance you're, you're playing as you work through your business case. And that's a balancing act, juggling act that we're working really closely with the national team on. But we recognise that beds are going to be really important, but equally important to that is getting your clinical model right, so you get your flow through the hospital right, so you don't have people in beds that shouldn't be in beds, and that's always, you know, that's the key challenge, and Steph's here today, and, the, and that's the challenge she faces on a daily on a daily basis, making sure we get that flow through the hospital right. And staff accommodation, at the moment we're not planning staff accommodation on the site, however, directly to the south, the power south of the site, there's a, uh, uh, designed some housing growth to the south there. So we're working really closely with the developers to ensure that we can have high quality, affordable housing built to the south there, which we can have access to uh, as part of our, our build. We will, uh, as part for our staff, we will have accommodation on site for overnight doctors, and we have to have that accommodation on the site for our, some of our medical staff. But staff, we're working more closely with the developers of the housing to the south of the site to ensure that we get some affordable housing built there as well, and that we get access to that. And that's very similar to the model that we have on the site at the moment. So the housing on our site is housing association site. It's not owned by the trust, and we have a long-term lease with that housing association for provision of that housing. So a very similar, very similar model. Um, oh, parking. Now, now you get my blood going. So I'm also responsible for parking on the existing site. And excuse me if you see me sink into my seat as I talk about parking. It's the, probably one of the key areas of complaint that we get on the site, both from staff and for patients. And it's something that is very close to my heart. So we're working really closely with the planning authorities. Uh, that is... Um, uh, um, 
the council to ensure that we get the parking right. As you rightly said, there's a balance to be had. There's an expectation, I think it's of 60% modal shift locally away from the motor car. Um, and uh, you know, I don't know if you know, but 5% of the traffic on the road any time uh, after between nine o'clock and five o'clock, 5% 5 of that traffic is going to or from an outpatient's appointment or to or from uh, a hospital in the UK. So we do take that really, really seriously, but getting the balance is, 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 is really tricky. So I think we have 1,250 spaces planned for the new site. Well, I, I think it's that, I, don't quote me on that number, it's something like that, but it, it is more, it's about 20% more than we have on the existing site, and you know the existing site is constrained. However, we're developing a really detailed travel plan, and that's expected early in the new year, to work through how we can work really closely with both the Sustainable Transport Corridor and all of our other partners to reduce as much travel as we possibly can to the site. And that's important for a number of reasons, not only the ambition to be net zero carbon and uh, the NHS's ambition to be uh, zero carbon by 2040, uh, but also the junction. Uh, so junction 7A of the M11 uh, is, going, is, is really critical um, uh, of, of the pressure of a, additional travel to, through that junction. So we, we're working really closely with both Essex and Epping Forest to ensure that we get the balance right. Um, I, there's going to be many iterations, I think, between now and the final hospital opening. Um, but we've also allowed on the site the, the ability to have both flat level car parking, but also if we need to at a later date, when we do our expansion, as an example, to have multi-storey car parking on the site as well. Um, so there are, again, we have, the one thing we don't know is exactly how much demand there's going to be in the future, so we've allowed for some future flexibility. But we're working really closely with the planning authorities and the traffic authorities around making sure we get the right numbers of car parking spaces on the site. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Lyon. Thank you, Jim. It's really the sort of opposite to what Councillor Rackham was talking about. I'm thinking more about less parking. Hello, Michael. <laughs> um, we are very keen to reduce car usage in Epping Forest, as generally is the case. Um, I'm interested in your transport and travel plans, but also in your sort of local distributed services where you need to reduce the amount of people that actually have to travel to a major hospital. So what is going on in your thinking to actually try and, if you like, devolve responsibility to more local facilities? So they're live, they're rough, right? So it's exactly the conversation that, that, that we have and the balance that we're trying to get between um, different drivers, uh, patients saying we need more space, staff saying we need more space, and quite rightly our, 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 our social and um, environmental responsibility and accountability to ensure that we reduce the number of uh, vehicles on the road um, and or make other forms of transport much more attractive. So um, the first bit is making sure we're linked into the existing infrastructure. So we're making sure we're linked into the Sustainable Transport Corridor and we're designing a transport hub on the site. So we will be the terminus point on the um, east-west uh, Sustainable Transport Corridor um, should that, when that goes in. So that's, that, that, that's the, fir the first point. Um, we will also be developing a, a travel plan. We haven't got that completed yet. We're working on that with some advisors at the moment, and we're hoping to have that in the new year. So I'll bring that back to this committee when we completed that travel plan to work that through in some detail. Um, distributed services, that's again, another really good challenge. Um, so we've just been working as an example. We're expecting to see uh, demand for um, diagnostic services, so radiology, uh, um, scans, uh, other diagnostic services increasing by 38% over the next 10 years. That's a massive increase in diagnostic services. So we've been working really closely with the CCG to look at where we might put a community diagnostic centre or community diagnostic hub. And um, we've been working through a range of options for that at the moment, but that's been primarily driven by patient access. So where are our patients? Where would they be? Where, are the, where would the flows be? How do we minimise those journeys? And how do we maximise the access to those services? Now, we are still at a very high early stage of that, but one of the sites we're considering as an example is the St Margaret site in or, in or around the St Margaret site we, where we have existing services at the moment. That's by no way finalised, and I don't want to set any hairs running by discussing that at, here, at, here at the hospital. I'm sure we'll be bringing that back when we've got the plans 
worked up in detail. I just wanted to give you that assurance that we will be working really closely with other parts of the system to ensure that we deliver services in a different way. But alongside that, we're also looking at service innovation. So how do we use technology to reduce the number of visits to the site? So a great example of that would be uh, um, uh, digital outpatients. So how do we, virtual outpatients, I should say, rather than digital outpatients, excuse me, virtual outpatients. So we've already reduced our outpatient appointments by about 20% and made about 20% of them virtual or reduced them completely. So the first point is, which ones don't we need at all? So how do we reduce those pointless journeys to a hospital that add no value to clinical care? Point one. Point two, how do, you, how do we prevent people from coming into the hospital if they don't need to come into the hospital? And then we can use virtual outpatient appointments. They're not suitable for everyone. They're not suitable for all conditions. And some of the risks associated with some conditions don't allow that to happen. So point three, we then bring people in who have to be in. Point four is, are there alternative places to deliver that? And can they be delivered in other settings? For example, complex GP surgeries, for example, closer to people's homes. So we're also looking at other models like that. Um, Steph, I'm sure when we're talking about some of our C uh, responses to CQC, we're also looking at things like virtual hospitals. So how do we care for people in their home settings? And that's a much more an emergency type response. So we're looking at a range of different ways to A, make services more accessible, but B, reducing the demand uh, to travel to and from the hospital. Hospitals, you should only be at if you are acutely sick. Every, that's absolutely uh, our, our vision, and it's not the best place always to deliver care. That, of course, has to be balanced off against the benefits you get from consolidating services. So it's better to have your, some of your services right next door to each other. So you, in your emergency department, you want quick access to your cardiology services, you want quick access to your radiology services, you want quick access to a range of other services within the hospital. So you have to balance that off distribution versus the benefit of co-location and working together collectively. Let's come back quickly. Yeah, that, that's really interesting and, and sort of fits in with my thinking. But one of the things we're trying to do is regenerate our high streets. So mm. it, in terms of your hubs and locations of diagnostic services, if they could be combined perhaps with local mm. high streets, that could add an in, improved dimension uh, where people would maybe go for coffee and then have a scan or a blood test or something like that. So I don't know whether that's involved in your thinking, but certainly that's something that I'd be interested in. So you may have well seen my chief exec smile because he's heard me many a times talking about um, high street regeneration and how we have a responsibility as an organisation to look at our high streets. Um, so the two areas we are looking at are the community diagnostic hub. Where would that go? Where would we put that? How would that work? Uh, but we're also, also looking at our ophthalmology services as well. Where would they go? How could we make those work as well? And the fifth fall through ophthalmology, it's, it's tens of thousands, I think. is I think it's about, Steph, about 10,000, I think it is. I think something like that, she's nodding. It's a huge number, so absolutely can have a massive impact in town centres. You have to balance that off, of course, with access. Uh, we have the same issues in town centres as, as, as access. But yeah, they are, that absolutely is in, in our thinking. Um, we currently have a renal service on our site. It's not run by us, it's run by another organisation. And I know they're also looking to not bring it up, not bring renal services up onto the new site and make sure they're located in a community type setting that's really accessible for individuals who have to go to dialysis three or four times a week. Um, so yeah, we're looking at a range. I couldn't say we've got those solutions yet, but we are absolutely looking at a range of solutions. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Wixley. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, one of my questions I think you've already tackled, uh, which uh, Councillor Rackham asked, that was regarding the capacity, but uh, compared with the, the current hospital. But could you actually put the figures on that in terms of the number of beds currently available in Princess Alexandra Hospital compared with what the new one will be? And I understand, I think you said that there's scope for future uh, increase uh, should the need arise. So uh, it would be interesting if you could actually put a figure on it on the number of beds comparison. That, that was one question. But my second question was that uh, when we had a presentation uh, before, uh, I think it was referenced uh, on, the, on the roof of the, the, the new uh, hospital uh, to have like a, a garden up there when you know, grow produce which could be used in, in, the, uh, in the hospital, which uh, sounded quite an interesting innovation to me. Um, but I, I haven't heard it mentioned this evening. I just wonder if that's still going ahead. Thank you. So um, we've, we've been calling it um, NHS Sky Farm 
actually. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll start on the front piece first. So yeah, we are still looking at that. That still, is still an option. Um, we specified it, we've worked it through, we've got a preferred way of delivering that, should we be able to make that happen. Um, I still think it's an important component about the holistic approach to healthcare, food as medicine, really getting people to think differently about, about food, but also giving an amazing green space. But we, we do have the benefit of a greenfield site, so we are working that through, but we have got a solution, actually. We've worked it through. We've worked with a team that developed the, um, the first one that I'm aware of, um, in a hospital in Boston, in the Boston Medical Center in the state. Uh, so that's Boston, Massachusetts, not Boston, Lincolnshire. Um, and, um, and, and they've really helped us come up with an innovative design actually. So that, that is still on the cards, um, all still pending funding, but um, it definitely does keep people smiling. So, so I'm about to give a real politician's answer and I feel quite uncomfortable. You can probably see me shifting in my seat. Uh, and you might not believe me when I say, well, when we talk about the number of beds, it depends what you count as a bed. Um, so let me give you an example. So we talk about general acute beds, uh, and we don't talk about maternity beds, and we don't talk about maternity cots, and we don't necessarily talk about assessment beds that we have in our ED department. So um, one of the things we're doing is we're putting 76 at the moment, we're planning 76 assessment beds in our ED department, and I think we've got something like 20 at the moment. Steph, is it something like that in the 27? 27. 27. 27 in our existing site. So we're increasing massively those number of assessment beds. So they come off our general bed base. But if we were going to count, count like for like, it is about 10% more thing. We have about 420 existing general uh, acute beds in our existing site. I think it's 419, actually. And we're going up to about 470 like for like. So it's about, it's about 40 additional beds planned at the moment. But as I said, we can expand that significantly. You can add another 20% of beds on without having any impact on the way the hospital runs or works. That would require more capital at a later date. But again, our balance is about making getting enough money now to get funded. We don't want to have wards stood empty or wards stood empty, which just attract people to, to be to come into the wards as well. So it's about getting that balance right. So it, but it's about it's about 40-ish more beds, 40 plus more beds additional. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Lee. Um, thank you, Chairman. A lot of what I was going to ask about has been mentioned, but my main concern is our area has more than half of it of people over 60 because they come out here to retire. Now, in Waltham Abbey, we're a long way from both Harlow and St Margaret's Hospital, and it costs more than £20 to go one way in a taxi to get to the hospital because we have no sustainable transport. This new hospital, as much as I, I mean, and I think it's brilliant and we're very lucky, is going to be even further away. Mm -hmm. So we need to really make sure that we've got some proper sustainable transport because at the moment um, you can't visit anyone in the hospital in the evening if you don't have a car and lots of elderly people don't drive at night because there's no buses. And so, you know, I think it's really important. I know the hospital itself is, is more important, but transport for people that are sick and need to visit sick people is very important. Yeah, I, I agree. And it is really difficult, isn't it, getting that balance right between uh, consolidating services, the opportunity to build a brand new hospital on a greenfield site, which is an amazing opportunity and allows us to do some really amazing things and work in a very different way, balanced off against how people access that and of course there are always winners and losers so there are always some communities that benefit we're closer to and more accessible and some that we don't so i absolutely recognize recognize that so um so what are we doing so we're working really closely with our partners so we don't uh, we're not responsible for all sustainable transport in the area but we're working really closely with our partners essex county council harlow yourselves to ensure that we can make make as many sensible decisions around transport and accessibility um, but it, it, it there will all, there will always be that challenge on access to a, a hospital in the center of town or or out of town thank you very much uh councillor barnott thank you um would it be an appropriate time to just talk uh, have a few questions over the cqc report uh no it, it, uh, oh that's afterwards yeah we'll do that after we'll do okay. the new hospital first and then come into that so that's we'll, fine thank you okay thank you um, Councillor Bassett, and I don't know whether community transport comes into this as well. Yes, I, I've heard what was said there, and I'd better declare I am chairman of trustees for community transport for Hollow and Epping Forest. 
and what they were talking about there seems linking in with our demand response transport schemes which is obviously something we're more than happy to talk to you about what we can do to assist especially excellent. long distances uh Mike, excellent. sorry excellent thank you just just give us a ring <laughs> <laughs> The, the other area is um, when you said all the design and everything you've gone through, are you designing with a budget in mind or are you designing the best case and then seeing if you can get the budget to build it all? And if not, do you have to knock it back a little bit? <laughs> it's, uh, okay, I'm going to sound like a politician, aren't I? It's a bit of both. <laughs> so you, you start with what you need and you design what you need. Um, and then you work back from that and you say, well, actually, where, where, can, we, where can we reduce cost um, without having an impact on quality? So that's where our, I mentioned modern methods of construction. That's where modern methods of construction comes in. So how do we build in a really cost-effective way off-site, bring it on-site, which is cheaper to build, um, has a greater impact um, on quality, so the quality is much improved, but then you have to balance that off against local services and local service provision working with local communities in order to, to, to build a facility itself. Um, so we started pretty much with an open book. Um, we have really tight constraints to which we have to design. They're called health building notes or HPNs um, and health technical notes, HTNs. And they're really tight constraints to which you have to design a building and you have to meet those requirements. If you move away from those, if you derogate away from those, you have to make a special case for that. For example, around infection and prevention control. However, we have made every taken every opportunity we can to reduce costs where it wouldn't uh, have an impact on quality. Um, so, for an example, really minimising the circulation space within the building. Now, that is great for patient and public experience, for visitor experience, because you don't have to wander down long, thin corridors. It's also great for hospital design, because it means you don't have to heat, clean or light a space, which isn't being used in a, in a continuous way. Uh, so, we've been looking at it through... Uh, all lenses. We've benchmarked ourselves against the other eight hospitals, and we benchmark extremely well. Um, I think we, per, per metre squared, we're probably the cheapest hospital, which also might make you nervous, um, but we benchmark really well per metre squared. But hospitals are really, really expensive to build. They're about £8,500 per metre squared. So every additional metre you build is an additional £8,500. And our hospital at the moment is at... I think it's at 83,000 metres squared, so it's a big old beast. Um, so we are looking for lots of areas to reduce that cost. Another area where we've looked to reduce our cost but not impact quality is to make sure that non-clinical areas are outside of the main building. So we have a training development centre and an admin block that sits outside of the main building. It's on the same site. There's literally a link to it, but it's not within the hospital building, so it's not constrained by the same building um, standards as a hospital, um, things like vibration, you have to have a vibration standard in a hospital, you don't have to have that in an office space because um, your laptop isn't as sensitive as a, 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 an MRI scanner. So we separate those buildings out, we can build that much cheaper, it's really accessible, really high quality, but not to the same standard as a hospital. So we've looked at it through multiple lenses to try to reduce our costs um, and maximise our investment in the clinical space for the hospital. All of the clinical areas are absolutely required, but even in the clinical areas, we've looked to say, well, how could we do those more, much more effectively and much more efficiently to make sure we get the best value for money? We've really, really challenged ourselves. Um, and if I'm absolutely brutally honest, I think there's more challenge to come because I don't think the fiscal uh, position in uh, UK PLC is going to get any better in the next uh, two or three years. So the second part is, have you given any thought yet to whether it will be a phased approach or are you going to totally build the new hospital and then move it there piece by piece? So our current preferred way forward with a brand new hospital at Greenfield site is to build it in one hit. So you build a single phase build of the new hospital and that is built. Uh, and then literally over the course of a week, you transfer your services across to the new site. And I can see Steph beginning to sweat as I say that because that is going to be one hell of a... Of, of a task in order to get everything moved over to, over to the new site. But that's our preferred way forward. Um, however, we have worked up plans to say, what would we do if we were to build it on the existing site? And that would be phased. However, our preferred way forward with the new hospital on Greenfield site is approximately three and a half years, nearly four years to build and commission. 
uh, our, if we were to do that as a phased approach on our existing site, that would be up to nine years to do that. So it has a significant impact both on quality of care, but also uh, cost of delivery. Um, so that's why our preferred way forward is a brand new hospital on the Greenfield site at the moment. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, I don't think I've got any more questions from members of the committee. So if I can go to Councillor Patel, who is coming in on the Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you for your presentation, Michael. C can you hear me clearly? I can, yes. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. brilliant. Thank, thank you for updating the Council as well on the progress being made with the, uh, with the new proposed site. I think um, Epping Forest residents were really lucky that the, the two, two hospitals that serve our residents were the ones that were earmarked uh, in the first tranche of um, development for new hospitals. Um, up, I mean, the, the um, You've already alluded to, to the, uh, the questions around bed capacities have already been discussed. Uh, my angle on this is slightly different, though, because obviously there's huge assumptions being made about the community-based model working and working well efficiently. Um, obviously, we've uh, we're, we're, the, the model of care, well, that's not the model of care, but the, essentially with the, the introduction of the ICSs uh, now that, that are coming in, is that going to impact on, uh, on, on um, the community-based model um, taking place. I mean, obviously, you're saying that four or five years' time, uh, well, in four or five years, you're looking to build the hospital. Um, we've got our local plans that have gone, that, that are in the process of being finalised and going and, and being adopted. There's going to be a population increase. And um, like, likewise, with Whips Cross, I had a concern there as well around the, the lack of, um, of an increase in bed capacity, 10% increase when you consider that the population growth is going to be significantly greater. There is going to be a huge burden on the community-based model working and, and working well. So I just wanted to understand where are we now with, with, those, um, um, with those projects that were being worked, that were worked on within the community to, to, to try and reduce down on the flow into the hospital. Um, next question really is around um, access to, to the hospital. Um, and, you know, comments have already been made about... Um, accessibility via uh, public transport etc um is is there a scope to to incorporate um a helipad on 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 the site as well um you know for for emergency purposes um i think the i think we've we've got a facility set up already at north world i believe which um uh, which is used to support but is there anything is is that likely to are you likely to accommodate this on site um at the new hospital. Okay, thank you for your two questions. I'll start with the difficult one first, which is the community model. So we've been working really closely with our community providers to develop our model of care. As I said, we've had GPs in the room, we've had mental health providers in the room, we've had community services in the room. We've worked with EPUT and to the east, and we've worked with the, uh, our community service providers to in, in Hertfordshire as well, uh, really closely in developing our, our, our community services. It's going to be a challenge. Uh, it's going to be a real challenge. We, we are setting up uh, local providers to work, work uh, closely together to develop our, our community model, and we continue to do that. And, we've all, and that's already started to have an impact. Uh, we've just had a, a main event room, uh, locally, uh, which has had, had a big impact on the delivery of services. But it is, as I said, it is gonna, it is gonna be a significant challenge going forward. Um, what I would say is with the ICS boundaries rem remaining the same, that's a benefit to us because we've got those embedded relationships. We're working closely with all of those organizations. We can continue with our plans as planned. Um, and all of our assumptions are aligned with the assumptions for the ICS. And our assumptions are also aligned to the assumptions uh, for Watford as well. So all of our all of our assumptions are completely aligned. We know the financial assumptions in the medium term financial plan allow for at least 50% of the growth to be funded, um, uh, the 50% of the demand growth to be funded in the community setting. Um, so um, the, the the plans are there. Um, are they fully formed and are they fully delivered? Absolutely not. They're not there yet. They are in development. They are being delivered. Are we working really closely with our partners to ensure that we deliver them in the future? 100%. Uh, we have a lot of time to develop those 
plans and get them working. So even if we started building tomorrow, we're still three or four years away from having the hospital ready. So in real, re real terms, it's probably 2027 is the sort of date we're beginning to look at now, given the delays to the national programme. So there's time to make sure that those plans are implemented. Um, what I would say is that all of the plans, both for ours and for Watford, um, West Hearts, that re require a modern acute hospital at the centre of those to ensure that efficiency and that delivery. So they, we can't deliver all of the benefits to the system without having uh, a, a new uh, high functioning um, um, uh, effective hospital right, right, right at the heart of that, of that service. Um, so I'm sorry I can't give you uh, a straight answer to say it's there, 100% confident it's gonna be delivered, but we're working on it really, really closely with our partners. It's the same challenge as every system across the country uh, is seeing. It is no different for us than for anyone else. Um, I've worked in multiple systems across the country and actually having an acute organization, inviting people in to develop a new model of care and say, how do we work collaboratively together is a breath of fresh air. So I think we're in a really good position to make it work locally. Um, access, uh, helipad, so no. So we're not planning on having a helipad. We have spoken to the health and safety executive. We've spoken to the air ambulance service. We've spoken to the East of England ambulance service, and we've spoken to our commissioners. Uh, we're not a trauma center. We're not a major trauma center at Harlow. So there's no requirement for us to have a helipad. We're also moving really, really close to the airport actually. So uh, being able to have quick access to, um, uh, uh, to um, uh, um, uh, air evacuation is, is simple to do. We're also going to have a lot of flat open car parking on the site and we're surrounded by green fields. So there would be a, the ability to, in an emergency situation, to have um, uh, uh, a helicopter land on, land on or at the site. But no, we're not planning on having a helipad on the site as a permanent fixture. And that's driven both by the fact we don't need one because we're not a major trauma centre and the huge additional cost and complexity around planning that that throws into designing a brand new hospital. Ch Chairman, can I come back in? Uh, just a quickie, please. <laughs> um, uh, thank, thank you for your detailed answer. Um, but in order for this community-based model to work, obviously the, um, there needs to be money in the system to, to enable it to happen. Have we got guarantee from government that they are they are prepared to support us when, in in make, in getting this off the ground? Because obviously, um, yes, they're investing in the hospital, but but in order for the hospital to work, we need this to work. So, have we got the guarantee from government to say, yeah, absolutely, you know, you're going to keep you're going to keep your bed occupancy at certain levels, um, but we can reinvest back into the community as well. And when is it likely to buy it? So when, when are we likely to see that? Um, a reduction of the flow into hospital. hospital. Well, so if, Steph, if Steph had her way, it'd be tomorrow morning, I think, would be when we would really like to see it by, because we've seen the highest number of attendances we've seen for, for a long time. So, to, but to answer your question seriously, and you know, it is a really serious question, something we take, take really seriously, there is no additional funding available, apart from pockets of funding, to uh, invest in community services. Everything has to be done within an existing cash envelope, and for us to ensure that we would Reduce the demand on on uh, on services. Um, as population goes up, the CCG will be funded more, uh, and they will get more money for their population, and they will and they will have what they call growth in their funding. So they will get that funding. The assumption is that 50% of that growth funding that will match the population growth will be invested in community services, which would have traditionally been invested in acute services. So that's where the additional funding is planning is planned to come from uh, for community services. I'll, in Ask Lance if he's got anything additional he wanted to add to that in a moment, but I think that's pretty much the position. Um, we have already had a significant impact. We think we've had a significant impact in demand, and we continue to work really closely with our community service providers. But it, it, it is it is it is the challenge. And I say community service providers, but it's also social care as well to make sure we've got the social care component right and um, you know you've seen the white paper for social care come out uh, recently it is the challenge for healthcare. it's not just a local local challenge lance do you have anything else you wanted to add to that 
So the only thing I'd say is that's uh, absolutely true from a revenue perspective, but of course there are uh, pockets of additional capital funding that's been provided and the uh, community diagnostic centres or community diagnostic hubs that Michael was uh, talking about earlier, there's a national process for uh, applications for additional, uh, genuine additional capital in, the, in order to be able to develop those. So uh, we're, uh, we're making sure that we avail ourselves of all additional capital possible um, for, the, uh, uh, for the right schemes, for the benefit of the local population. Uh, but as Michael said, the revenue costs uh, need to be funded from uh, either the growth monies um, as the population genuinely grows or from us reinvesting uh, the current revenue that we have uh, by providing services in a different way. Okay, thank you very much for that. And um, finally, I've got Councillor Bedford. Thank you, Chairman. A um, couple of questions, really. First of all, I sit on the Harlow Gilston board, so I'm aware of the travel corridor issues. And I think it's going to be key that... Uh, you liaise with the board with regards to the transport corridor and ensuring that if you provide shift change times that the, the Harlow Gilston board can actually work with the transport hubs to make sure that buses arrive perhaps 15 minutes before so that we take the pressure off your car parks and staff have got good ways of getting to work. Um, the second point I'd like to make is that we've obviously put forward a suggestion previously and I see that the signs behind you still refer to the Princess Alexander Hospital and I know that there will be an element of perhaps the old hospital remaining on site for some specialist services at some point in the future. I think bearing in mind the obvious uh, points that have come forward about the ageing population going forward, I think now is the ideal time to actually reconsider the name of the hospital. And um, we've mentioned already, uh, it's been sent up to you, that the Princess Philip Memorial Hospital would be a good name going forward. Uh, one, we're using the Prince Philip's name and also with all the housing and all the development going on and all the elderly people in the area, it's going to avoid confusion in the future about where your hospital appointment is and which hospital you go to. So it's a clear break from the old hospital and it's a new start, new beginning, new hospital. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I didn't think there were any such thing as new questions, but that is uh, definitely uh, the first time I've been asked about um, renaming the hospital. Um, our current plans are to retain the name uh, Princess Alexandra because we'll fundamentally be moving off the main site. There may be some services remaining there, but it would be some, something like the urgent treatment centre may remain on that site, but that's still to be decided. And the expectation is that we retain the name of the existing hospital. Um, it's not to say we wouldn't, re we wouldn't consider uh, an alternative name, but at the moment the plans are to retain the name of the Princess Alexandra Hospital. And the transports part of the question? Oh, uh, so, so sorry, yes, sorry, I thought that was, a, that was an offer. So absolutely, uh, we will work I, really closely with you it, around it, the sorry, transport with some way away. Yeah. Just linked in with that particularly though, are you talking, I know it's a long way off, but the Hertfordshire S6 rapid transport system that is proposed or is being discussed at the moment, which is from the west of Hertfordshire through into Harlow, and the talk is going up to Stansted Airport, but obviously the hospital would be a, a fairly good link through on that route by the sounds of it. So I haven't had any direct conversations about that with the rapid transport link, um, but I'm absolutely happy to link in with... Uh, who, who's driving that? Is that Essex driving that? I think it's... Hertfordshire is definitely, I think, leading it, but Essex are equally are involved. Okay. I can definitely link in with that, but we haven't been linked in to date. No. No, thank you very much for that. Uh, well, thank you for taking all the questions on that and giving us an insight into the way forward for the new build and when hopefully we'll have a bit more information next time we see you on dates and times for things actually happening. So if we can now move on to the other part of the evening, which is around the uh, CQC report, which was published in... Um, I was going to say September, but the last visit was in September. It's published in November, the 17th of November. Um, Lance, are you going to introduce that? Yes, thank you very much, Chair. So um, <clears throat> what I do is um, I'll just work out how to share my uh, screen in a second. Um, and uh, we've got uh, a number of slides I'll just talk you through in terms of the facts and some of the key things that come out of the report for uh, uh, for colleagues who haven't had a chance to uh, to read the detail yet. Um, and then uh, I'll hand over to uh, to Steph to um, uh, to uh, um, 
can we see that, um, uh, to uh, then talk through some of the actions that, uh, that we've undertaken uh, since. So just to give you um, a quick overview, so um, we had, um, well, I think everyone knows who the CQC is, um, but the regulator for, um, uh, for health and social care, uh, and they carry out a whole range of different um, uh, inspections. Um, we had um, one or, or we're one of the first organisations in the country to have their new version of uh, inspections, which are carried out over an eight week, eight week period over July and August. Um, and they focused um, predominantly on three of our uh, clinical services. So our urgent emergency care services, our medical services, uh, medical specialties, and uh, our maternity services. And then they also interviewed a number of people to look at um, uh, what they call well-led. So they, uh, they uh, tend to um, look at organizations, and I'll show you the scorecard in a second, um, based around five domains um, of, uh, and, uh, and then the number of a range of services. So they looked at a couple of domains for those uh, specialties. Um, and uh, overall, in terms of um, in terms of uh, how they rated us, uh, we remained as uh, requires improvement overall um, as a trust. And uh, and then you can see at the high level against each of the individual domains that they measure. So are our services safe, effective, caring, responsive, and well-led? Uh, we uh, remained as requires improvement for four of those, and uh, and remained as good for um, uh, for the care that, of the services uh, that uh, that we provide across uh, across the board. Um, and uh, and then here's the detailed um, scorecard uh, that you can see with the domains across uh, the top and then the individual services uh, down, uh, down the left-hand side. Uh, the uh, black arrows um, are the CQC's um, uh, arrows and, uh, and uh, they show um, whether the rating has um, improved, decreased or remained the same uh, since their previous inspection of those individual uh, domains and those individual services. So as you can see from all of the uh, arrows uh, on, uh, on the new or latest scorecard, card, uh, there were no changes made to any of the ratings of any of the services that the CQC inspected uh, through, uh, through July and August. Um, and uh, our urgent and emergency care services um, um, were um, uh, downgraded um, to, from a safe domain perspective and from a well perspective uh, from requires improvement to inadequate uh, when the CQC inspected us in February. Um, and, uh, and then they remained as inadequate when they came and inspected us or in CC's eyes uh, when they inspected us um, through, uh, through the um, uh, end of the summer and, um, and into the start of the autumn. Um, in the terms of the detail within the reports, um, they also, as you can see, colleagues um, outline uh, what they call um, actions that we must do um, and actions that we should do. Um, and we've received 18 uh, must do's and uh, 11 should do's. Um, as you can see, for, and we'll talk a little bit more about those in a second. Um, as you can see from the scorecard, uh, we remain good um, um, all the way down for all of our services uh, for the caring domain, other than for children and young people, which is, uh, remains as outstanding. Um, and we remain overall requires improvement for the other four domains um, and overall uh, as requires improvement for the trust. Um, and just, uh, just in case uh, members aren't aware, there are four um, uh, for uh, ratings that you can get for each of those uh, individual domains and services, uh, inadequate being the bottom one, uh, requires improvement, good, and then outstanding. Um, so you can see about two thirds of the scorecard there um, is good, uh, just under two thirds is good. Um, and then you can see, uh, you can see the couple of pockets of, uh, of inadequate. Um, in terms of uh, going through the reports, I can't remember how many pages it is, it's about 90 or so pages um, uh, in terms of a detailed report. Um, I say I've tried to pull in the next couple of slides just a couple of, uh, or to summarise the, the themes of good practice and then to summarise the themes for improvement. Uh, so in terms of the themes for good practice, so the patient panel, so um, uh, I know uh, many of you uh, engage with uh, colleagues who, um, who are on our patient panel, uh, and that was identified as a, uh, as a um, piece of outstanding practice. Um, and uh, identified as it being the only model of its kind in the region um, and really supporting um, both our patients and our, and our people and our colleagues who work um, in the organisation on a daily basis. Um, and massive credit, I'd just like to put on record massive credit and a huge thanks to, uh, to all of uh, the members of our patient, uh, patient panel. Uh, for all the work that they do to, to sort of continually support our patients and ensure and challenge us as an executive team to make sure that uh, uh, we are doing everything we possibly can to make, uh, uh, make, um, uh, the, uh, make the services as good as they can be. 
Um, and uh, then in terms of other themes of, uh, of good practice, I won't go through each of these in detail, but you can see these were themes that were consistent across all of those three um, uh, clinical services that uh, the CQC colleagues inspected. There were plenty of other themes of good practice that were specific to um, individual, um, individual um, services, um, but the commitment of staff and the, their um, desire to continuously learn came out really, really strongly and really positively. Um, the way that we have managed uh, COVID, um, and I think um, we just Need to, uh, just need to add in here that uh, the, the impact of COVID has clearly been significant on everybody. It's been significant on obviously health and social care providers, it's been obviously been significant all of us as individuals in, uh, in our own uh, uh, personal lives as well. Um, but, um, and we're still obviously in the middle of the pandemic, but um, since, the, uh, since the numbers started to uh, drop off in terms of hospitalization through the end of the second wave, from about March or April time, we are now, or have seen consistently, uh, we're now up at about a 19% increase in demand for our urgent and emergency care services, so for our emergency department services, A&E and &E in, in Old Speak. Um, uh, since uh, from between April and, uh, and November so far this year, compared to pre-pandemic levels. So that is putting an enormous strain um, onto, uh, onto our services. It's putting an enormous strain onto hospital, and it's obviously putting an enormous strain onto all of our staff and all of our colleagues who are working uh, tirelessly to, to manage the care for those patients. And in addition to that, and one thing that was great that the CQC uh, picked up on from my perspective was how we had managed COVID and how we uh, were utilising PPE, so personal protective equipment, to, uh, to ensure that we keep uh, both uh, colleagues and uh, patients and visitors as safe as we possibly can. Do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but the way we're managing COVID at the front door for urgent emergency care is what we've we've separated out uh, the emergency department into what we've called red um, and uh, and uh, uh, ED and the green ED. But basically, anyone who's got uh, COVID-based symptoms goes through um, a, a separate entrance and a completely separate department to those who don't have COVID uh, symptoms. Um, and similarly, within the main body of the hostel, we have a separate red ITU department and separate green ITU department. So uh, we were uh, praised for that and praised for the speed with which we'd move to those and create those services um, and, uh, and keep, uh, keep all of our patients as safe as we can do and prevent uh, nosocomial infections or patient-to-patient -patient infections of COVID. Um, but of course, what that also does is put even more additional strain onto, uh, onto our colleagues because we're now running an emergency department across two footprints with the same, uh, with a 20% or nearly 20% increase in demand with the same uh, staff base so it just continually adds to us we're doing everything to make sure our patients are as safe as possible it continually adds to all of the pressure that the staff are facing um, in terms of other good practice um, practice around uh, as you can see there about how we manage patient safety in incidents and how we take um, uh, really seriously uh, the review of, uh, of any deaths that we have in the organization and take any learning from that and that links back up with the earliest point of, uh, earlier point around continuous learning so some really good uh, practice that comes out of the um, report consistently um, of course um, with all of these inspections there are and of course there's always things that we can do differently and we can do better so in terms of consistent themes that came uh, out of areas for improvement um, across each of those uh, or across all of those uh, areas that they inspected um, there's uh, there is the six uh, bullet points there so um, we have an underlying uh, non-compliance with some of our mandatory training um, and we've got some uh, actions in place around uh, around that um, and then some concern around and this again to some degree links to the the, the demand and the sheer demand on our services but um, the timely completion um, of the clinical risk assessments um, up front as patients enter enter the uh, hospital and then the actions taken as a result of those assessments um, and uh, and then we've got some um, or the CQC colleagues had some concerns around the quality of our uh, documentation uh, and that links very strongly into the work that we've been doing around um, improving everything um, uh, that we do from an IT and a digital perspective so um, as I think um, we've spoken to, uh, to to the committee a couple of times before in terms of the way that uh, we are currently in the process of um, uh, getting an outline business case approved for a new um, um, uh, all signal dance in electronic health record where we'll be able to capture uh, patient information effectively and systematically um, uh, in one place. At the moment, we capture patient information in uh, depending on the department, two or three different places, uh, which uh, which uh, then leads uh, to uh, obviously the potential increased uh, increased risk um, in terms of the management of the patient. So we're we've got some really uh, strong actions in place to address and resolve that. Um, uh, and uh, and CQC obviously identified the concerns that we'd uh, we'd already identified. 
Um, so uh, not uh, being complacent about that, and Steph will take you through some of the specific actions in a second, but uh, on the positive side, the CQC colleagues didn't find anything that we weren't uh, aware about and we weren't uh, addressing, um, but clearly um, we have a number of things to do um, and a number of things to continue to, uh, to address, particularly in relation to our management of urgent emergency care departments through, uh, through the uh, patients, sorry, through the uh, emergency department. Um, so I'll hand over quickly to Steph now uh, to take you through some of the real specifics of things that were already in place and other things that we've put in place as a result of the CQC conversation. Thanks, Lance, uh, and thank you for uh, inviting us this evening. Uh, so some of the actions that we've already taken and the work that is underway, as Lance has said, there were no surprises in the CQC inspection, and we work closely with the CQC uh, regulators uh, in some of our work streams. So as an organisation, uh, at the start of the year, we launched our 10-year uh, strategy, so uh, PHT 2030, which is setting out uh, a number of work streams, a number of areas of, of development, uh, which complement the work that the, uh, the CQC have identified as good practice. We've spoken around the must and should do's uh, in terms of the CQC findings, uh, not unusual. Uh, you will see that in most uh, CQC inspection reports. And again, no surprises uh, in those areas. What we have done is wrap around uh, and develop a quality program management office um, specifically to keep track and to provide the support across our clinical and operational teams um, to, uh, to provide that evidence of, of ongoing work and ongoing development and to have a governance framework in place to capture all of that information. Specifically around the emergency department, um, we've, as Lance has mentioned, a uh, significant increase in pressure uh, on our emergency services, uh, both in the hospital, uh, across primary care and across our ambulance colleagues. Just to put some, in, uh, some of that into context, um, at the start of the year, we commissioned uh, an external piece of work with an external organization to provide some additional um, oversight, some additional coaching and support to our management teams and our new operational teams in the department. Uh, to, to help us uh, design uh, clear work streams to provide um, oversight and again support the increase in demand on our services. That work has continued, five clear work streams in place, a clear governance structure with clear milestones, timelines um, and objectives uh, for the team to deliver against. We have good executive oversight in place to support the team and we also have oversight through our ICS colleagues again, on a regular basis, uh, and we can see evidence of, of, of improvements. Uh, despite the increase in demand, we can see clear evidence of improvement in some of those areas. Um, in terms of our urgent treatment centre, again, an area of expansion and an area of, of, of really good development with primary care colleagues, our CCG colleagues, um, and um, community teams to provide, and again, an additional area for our, our patients to be seen. We've spoken around uh, documentation, um, and this, this slide re uh, relates to our uh, ED nerve center business case, which is again is, a, is an improvement on uh, various uh, systems we have in place to capture all of the patient observations and oversight for, um, for our clinical team. So again, um, making it easier uh, for our teams on the ground uh, to do their jobs. Paediatric services, again, whilst adults have seen an increase in demand, paediatrics have also seen an increase in demand. And one of the areas that the CQC identified was support for uh, young people and children uh, that require the, the input of mental health services. We do have a dedicated mental health uh, room within paediatric um, ED, and we're working closely with our mental health colleagues um, to seek further advice and input into how we can make that a better environment uh, for young people whilst they're waiting for further assessment. Sharon McNally, the Deputy Chief Executive and Director of Nursing and Midwifery, um, leads a system mental health quality forum, which has been in place now for about 18 months uh, to two years. So again, looking at mental health services across, uh, across the ICS, but also again across our local health uh, system, working with colleagues so that we can provide the best and appropriate uh, mental health services uh, for our patients. And uh, another action that, which is underway, which is identified in the CQC report, was our divisional management structures. And we took the learning from uh, wave one of COVID. Um, we took the learning from our clinical and operational teams. We have reviewed and restructured our divisional teams. We've strengthened and expanded the number of clinical lead roles across the organization. We've, addition, we've put additional posts in, in terms of patient safety, quality and governance. And we went live with our new operational structures on the 1st of December this year. 
That's a significant piece of work. That's taking the learning from COVID and also looking at where the, the patient pathways are best served so that we can bring services together to provide really good quality outcomes for our patients. Actions going forward for the next 12 months um, and, and beyond. So continuing to develop and progress with our 10-year uh, strategy, clear work streams in place, uh, clear milestones to achieve. The new hospital, which Michael uh, has spoken at length about this evening. Again, another key area which is identified in the report is the continuation of recovery of all of our elective services. And I think we've spoken previously around all of the work which we're undertaking across the organisation, uh, supported uh, with real good engagement from our patient panel um, and how we can continue to support patients uh, on our waiting lists. Again, clear evidence uh, and completion of our CQC musts and shoulds uh, and how we wrap around uh, our quality PMO uh, to support that evidence. Responding and being, uh, being agile, I think, in terms of further waves of COVID, uh, we have to be uh, continuously reviewing the numbers, the impact on our services, the impact on our staff, um, and how we respond to further increases uh, in demand uh, of, of numbers of patients presenting, both from an outpatient point of view, emergency point of view, and those patients that require inpatient support. A really key bit um, of uh, support is around the health and well-being of our staff. Can't underestimate the impact that COVID has had uh, on our workforce. And again, how we are continuously supporting them uh, over winter in particular, which is always a challenging time. But again, how we support them in terms of the health and well-being, how we continue to recruit, retain uh, and support our workforce. And then another key action uh, in terms of the organisation is how we continue to develop our culture, open, honest, transparent culture, how we engage with our workforce, how we continuously learn as an organisation. I think there are a couple of key questions uh, within the, uh, the, the questions that were raised previously in terms of our nurse recruitment position in terms of ED. Um, and again, uh, despite COVID and despite the pressure on our services, really good uh, recruitment program in place. I'm pleased to, um, to advise that we have, we have no consultant vacancies uh, within the emergency department. We've just appointed four new consultants to our team, two of whom were, pre were previous trainees uh, within the organization. So a really good positive step forward. Um, and our anticipation by the end of March next year is that we will be down to less than 2% qualified nurse vacancy position. So a significant amount of work from our senior nursing colleagues um, uh, across the organization. Um, I will pause there, Lance, I think, uh, and then uh, take questions. Thank you very much for that. Uh, quite a wide ranging coverage of the report. Um, I've got two people so far to ask questions. Uh, Councillor Barnett. Councillor Barnett. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. And the first thing I'd like to say is that um, Princess Alexandra were fantastic when my son was born and I'll be going back there in a few days for uh, the birth of my next child. So um, I just want to personally thank you for um, everything. Um, of course, it's been challenging times, um, and I do. St I have just a few questions, and perhaps if I ask the questions first, and then whoever is best placed to answer them uh, can do so. Um, obviously, because of COVID, I haven't just looked at this report, but I've looked at previous CQC reports for the um, for, for the NHS Trust, just to see if there are any themes that uh, do um, do come about. Um, and the first one was really on leadership, and uh, in particular, page six of the report. Um, and one thing that seems to have been in place back in 2017, as well as now, is that there seems to be a, a high turnover of leadership roles. Um, that's something that was flagged up in this report. It's something that's been flagged up following the inspection on the 5th of December 2017, uh, where they're saying that there is a, a, a broad mix of capable, uh, sorry, the board had a mix of capable, new and experienced leaders. So I just want to know, in terms of the first question is, is there something more that can be done? Because there seems to be a re recurring theme here that the, the people at the top seem to be changing quite, um, quite frequently and quite often. That's the first, that's the first, first question. Um, the next is in relation to the vision um, and on page seven. I, I appreciate that um, the, the new vision and values and strategy has been put into place and it was initially put off because of COVID. Is there a risk that the new vision, values and strategy is likely to be delayed if there is an another peak uh, 
um, with the new variant. And again, on the vision, um, there seems to be a, di a disparity. Uh, back in 2017, um, the CQC had um, said that the Trust had clear vision and strategy that all staff understood and put into practice. But when we look at the CQC report back in this November, it says that there is a lack of understanding in relation to the strategy. And I just wanted to know what steps are being taken to ensure that staff and system partners are understanding the vision, value and strategies. And, and, and just to conclude, um, my final um, question is, um, on page nine, uh, it talks about staff at all levels were not clear about their roles and responsibilities. Now, I'm not sure whether this is so much of a COVID pressure issue, but it just comes across quite surprising that staff don't know about their roles and responsibilities. And I just wonder to what extent that might be set out when they're, when they're first employed, or whether it's clarified in terms of any recruitment or line management meetings. Um, that, that would just be a very helpful question. And finally, and this is my absolute last question, is, you know, see, I know the CQC sometimes do spot inspections, but does the trust carry out mock inspections? Because some of, some of the um, issues in this report seem to be quite basic issues and may not necessarily be attributable to COVID. Just want to know what safeguards there might be by way of mock CQC inspections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. So shall I um, uh, kick off with those and then uh, maybe ask Steph to come in afterwards. So in terms of the first question, in terms of the high turnover of roles, so um, uh, um, so we did have um, a significant uh, high turnover of executive directors um, from the uh, two inspections ago, from about four or five, uh, four or five years ago. Um, in fact, um, tomorrow marks the day that we would have had an executive team that would have been, every single one would have been in place for at least a year. So the last person is a year's or anniversary um, is up um, uh, is up tomorrow so um, <clears throat> we have got from my perspective we have got um, uh, and increasingly got some real stability amongst uh, amongst the executive uh, executive team uh, we have had um, uh, in terms of uh, three new additional members to the executive team uh, within the last just over the year so we've created one of the, one of which was a, a brand new role so we've created a chief information uh, officer role because uh, of the need to really enhance some um, and push forward on our digital agenda uh, so that was a completely new role um, and uh, and we had um, a finance uh, our finance director um, who took an opportunity to move to another organization um, and uh, had, had been a stable uh, a stable member of the team for a, a long period of time I think maybe six years or so I think Trevor had been working with us um, and uh, and then the other was a medical um, director role and uh, and our previous medical director took the um, uh, decision to retire through um, uh, through uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. But uh, but as of tomorrow, um, then we would have had uh, everyone on in place for a year. We have had um, some recent turnover of our chair and non-executive um, directors. Uh, so the non-executive directors are obviously independent and hold us as executive directors to account. They uh, run in three-year terms generally. Um, and so naturally, there's always a cycle. And it's really important that there's always a cycle to maintain that independence. So we have... Uh, we have a number of or a couple of new uh, non-executive directors but also we've been intentionally trying to enhance the non-executive di uh, director uh, team by appointing uh, what we call associate non-executive uh, non directors so um, that it does a couple of things one is ensure that we have uh, local residents who really know uh, the local population and have links in with uh, links in with uh, you know with key um, uh, key local community groups, um, but also to create a, uh, a sort of succession plan so that people can move on from the associate non-executive director role um, uh, potentially into uh, being full-blown non-executive directors. So, uh, so we've uh, created that in the last uh, within the last year as well, uh, two new non associate non-executive directors in the last year. So, whilst um, I agree with the CQC that there are a number of individuals who are relatively uh, new into the team, uh, I think it's uh, for understandable reasons and or for genuine planned reasons when it comes to the non-executive directors. Um, and then as Steph um, has uh, indicated and outlined in terms of the divisional uh, structure and divisional restructure that we've uh, undertaken to support and enhance the amount of senior clinical leadership within the organization underneath the executive director team, um, then at the time the CQC came in, we were in the process of, uh, of going through that process. So yes, there were some new individuals in there, but again, for the right reasons to enhance. And it's, it, it, we've been expanding it in terms of senior clinical leadership roles, but obviously people who were new into new into those roles 
Um, in terms of your question about uh, the strategy and the vision and the understanding of that, so um, obviously um, pretty much as soon as you write a strategy, it's out of date to some degree and they need to stay live and they need to be updated on a regular basis. We took um, the view that uh, when the NHS long-term plan came out a couple of years ago, that at, at absolutely because it was so fundamentally different in terms of how the, um, the expectation from the government of how the NHS would work into the future um, and then because of uh, what was expected to be at the time uh, the changes to which have subsequently happened or in the process of happening the changes to uh, integrated care systems that actually we needed to have a look at our organizational strategy and um, they're also aligned with us getting the announcement from um, uh, from the Prime Minister to say that actually we were part of the front runner rate for the new hospital so uh, so we decided actually we needed to update the strategy, which I think is absolutely right and appropriate, and we needed to have a really big change in focus. Um, and it's enabled us to, to put the new hospital and the new models of care right at the heart and the center of our thinking. It's enabled us to think about the digital agenda and how we invest properly in technology to support patients and patient care and to support the way that uh, all of our colleagues work. Um, and it enabled us to respond absolutely to a lot of things that we've, uh, we've talked about this evening around the community um, uh, models of care um, and, uh, and about how we want to provide services going Going forward. So we did a lot of work uh, with that. We did a lot of engagement um, uh, with, uh, with colleagues within the organisation about that. And we were about to launch it just as the first wave of COVID hit. Um, so we, our plan was to launch it in uh, April 2020. 20 is that right yes um, and obviously the first wave of covid um, uh, started to hit the country in february and it hit us locally in march so we put that on hold uh, obviously whilst uh, whilst it was um, everyone focused on the management of, of covid and we actually didn't formally launch our strategy until september just gone um, so just after the CQC um, uh, had inspected us. What we did do was uh, took the opportunity in uh, end of June, start of July uh, this year to do what we called a soft launch, which was to restart the re-engagement um, uh, re with all of our colleagues from the work that we'd undertaken sort of 15 uh, to 18 months prior to that. So at the time that the CQC colleagues came in, we had restarted that engagement piece and really started to talk to colleagues about it, but we hadn't formally launched it. Um, and so, uh, so understandably, uh, not everybody in the organisation was fully aware of the strategy or what it meant or the implications of it. Um, we then, um, in terms of your question about is it going to be delayed, so no. So we absolutely formally launched it with our new values and our behaviours and our behaviour charter. We launched that formally in our staff engagement event in September. Um, and, uh, and we are now talking about it all the way through the organisation and have been for the last, uh, last three uh, months or so. So it's there and I think if CQC colleagues came into uh, came mean to inspect us today i would um i would be certain that many more people would understand it understand the impact of it and understand how it works across their service um and uh, it picks up on a lot of the things that we've been uh, that we've been talking about earlier this evening um in terms of um, mock inspections, and yes, absolutely, we undertake uh, mock inspections on a regular basis, um, and we also utilise our independent non-executive directors to do uh, walkabouts um, uh, as well, so that they have a, a third-party eye. Obviously, uh, some of that has taken a little bit of a back step in terms of um, um, uh, through the pandemic as we've been managing managing COVID and certainly we've been restricting external um, colleagues both in terms of um, other colleagues plus visitors coming onto the site during COVID and that has reduced the amount of um, external third party oversight that we have had through those walkabouts. We have just reunited them and restarted them. Um, and we've also, as it was one of the lines that Steph was talking about in terms of how do we embed some of the changes that the CQC colleagues have said, we've, uh, we have a, an enhanced program of our senior nurses uh, working with their other clinical colleagues to uh, undertake mock inspections in different parts of the organization that they don't normally work in. Um, and we will continue to drive that. And uh, it's a really, as well, obviously as, uh, as you've raised it, it's a, um, you understand it's a really good way of um, uh, uh, challenging ourselves on a constant basis about are we doing the best that we possibly can um, and are we seeing things that, uh, uh, that we should be seeing um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of being able to make those changes to support our patients. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Rackham. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for uh, the report. Um, Recognising the enormous pressure that NHS services have been under, um, I'd like to thank you for what you do for us. Um, I'd like to ask you that if the CQC came in tomorrow and inspected again, 
Can you tell me, would there be a difference in how they'd find the emergency service and the maternity departments? Um, and I have another issue here. Um, regarding staff, and I'm not talking about consultants and management staff here, I'm talking about all the other staff that are needed to run a hospital. Um, I am concerned about exhaustion and the lack of breaks, and I wonder what you are doing on that to improve the lives um, of the staff that you have in the hospital. Thank you. Yep. Oh, Do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, happy to, uh, I'm happy to take that question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so if the CQC came in tomorrow, what would they see? Uh, they would absolutely see our teams uh, committed to providing the safest, most high quality care that they can possibly provide under the circumstances of a busy uh, and pressurised emergency department. And those pressures have continued since the CQC came to visit us. What they would see is a workforce that is committed to improvement, that a workforce that could talk through their improvement programmes, their five key work streams, they could talk about their governance structure, and they could talk about the steps that they're taking to improve the services for our patients. They will be able to talk about the safety huddles that are embedded within the department and how they maintain oversight and safety for all of our patients. They'll be able to talk about the work that I mentioned previously in terms of the expansion of our urgent treatment centre, how we're supporting our patients in terms of accessing the most appropriate uh, pathways at the right time. They talk about the work that we've done with our maternity colleagues in terms of developing uh, a new maternity improvement board. Our new uh, director of midwifery who started uh, a couple of months ago and they talk around our safety champions within maternity and the work that they're doing in terms of recruitment. They talk about the initiatives that they have in terms of governance and how they've got clear oversight um, in terms of risk, um, areas of risk and recruitment and retention um, across our services. There is undoubtedly still pressure within both of those key areas within the organisation, but there's good oversight and there's good awareness of where the risks are and how we're mitigating those risks on a daily basis. So I think that's what the CQC would see. They'd see a workforce that's committed, trying to do their best and being able to articulate where the risks are and what the plans are in place to address those risks. In terms of staff, it's a, that's a really good point uh, and a really key area that we are, uh, we are mindful of uh, and take really seriously. Um, throughout COVID and, and throughout the last 18 months, we've had a number of initiatives in place to support our workforce, all of our workforce. Every single person is, is a key asset and an absolute uh, 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 advocate uh, for providing services to our patients. We've had uh, external support in terms of uh, actual psychological support, staff health and wellbeing support um, from our EPUC colleagues, um, from our, from our uh, other colleagues uh, that can provide that uh, mental health and wellbeing support. We've increased our number of mental health champions and first aiders within the organisation. We've also had um, external support in terms of, um, you may have seen Project Wingman, um, so again, airline crews that have been providing support across NHS organisations, uh, and in fact, we've just had recently had them back within the organisation, again, to provide that, that, uh, that break, uh, breakout area and, and chill out space for staff. We've provided drinks, refreshments, um, uh, you know, a, a nice, nice gestures for staff. We're just about in the next... Uh, two weeks, I think, to open our brand new staff lounge, um, our Alex lounge, a brand new training and education facility for our staff. So again, recognising that people need that breakout space, they need a nice area to go and, and relax in and take their breaks. If those areas have, have not been able to, um, to leave their ward areas, uh, particularly during the COVID ward areas, we've taken food and refreshments um, to those areas to provide staff uh, with that opportunity to at least have a drink, have something to eat. Um, and we're just looking at our increase in volunteers as well. So again, that we can provide that uh, on the ground uh, support for our staff there as well. Thank you very much for that. Um, Councillor Murray, I know you put in quite a number of questions before the meeting. Do you feel that you've had answers through the presentations? That yeah, we've that, had? That, I have to say that's why I was a a little bit confused. I've, I've checked the minutes and we were clearly asked to give our questions in advance. I did what you asked. I spent three hours early the next morning and I literally mean got up early to read the yeah. report in full and you had the nine questions by, uh, I've got the email in front of me. 
And I just wondered what had happened to them, because they've not been uh, taken, have they? It, I feel as if I've wasted my time, to be honest. So you don't feel that they've been answered within the presentations by the... Uh... Well, not in the manner that I would normally expect. I mean, we are used to tabling questions in advance and the questions being directly answered. But, uh, you know... Right. Certainly, uh, having looked through some of the, you know, your questions, some of those areas have been covered, I can see, from what we've heard this evening. Yes, but in a very difficult way to tie into the actual questions. So I, I, I feel as if I wasted my time, to be honest, uh, uh, I might as well have just turned up tonight and made up my questions as uh, I went along. I, I came up with very detailed questions, but we'll leave it, Chairman. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think I've got any members of the uh, committee to ask. Yes, of course, <laughs> Councillor Jennings. <laughs> thank you very much. Really, this goes back to the first presentation uh, with building of the new hospital. Um, I just wondered what the future uh, was for the Hearts and Essex Hospital the Rotary Clinic and St Margaret's here in Epping. Do you want me to take that? So more than, more than happy to take that. So we are still working through the future of those different sites. There will be healthcare provided in all of those sites. Exactly what will be provided in those sites, we we'll be working with our commissioners to decide uh, what's best delivered there. So, um, so as an example, St Margaret's site, we have our services, our outpatient services delivered there. There are some community beds on that site and there are some mental health beds on that site. There will always be community beds on that site for the foreseeable future in the PFI that's on that site. However, we know that EPUT are looking at where they want to put all of their mental health beds. They're talking about whether or not they want to co-locate on our new site. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we're talking about whether or not we put a community diagnostic up on that site. But no decisions are have yet been reached about exactly what will go on those sites. So, uh, but all, I can uh, I can reassure you there will be healthcare services on all of those sites going forward in the, in the future. Thank you. Uh, and Councillor Patel. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for the presentation. Um, as the Chairman of the Health and Wellbeing Forest Health and Wellbeing Board, can I just put on record my thanks uh, to all of the staff at PAH um, for, for serving the community during this COVID period uh, in uh, what must have been at times very difficult circumstances, um, especially dealing with issues day to day and not knowing what was going to happen next. Um, so please, if you can pass that back on to them, I'd be very appreciative. Um, a few questions, really. Well, one, really, um, in terms of um, embedding um, standards into in, into practice, um, we can put action plans together, but they can only be properly embedded um, by by the staff that 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 are working there. Um, and it becomes very difficult when when there are shortages of staff and there is the need then to use agency staff. Um, Following, following Brexit, um, what, what impact does that had on on the, on the amount of staff, uh, agency staff usage that you have now within the organisation? Um, secondly, as well, uh, the, the next question is around um, previous action plans that were um, sections. I know that you worked your, your way through those action plans and, and and brought in a number of changes which were embedded at the time. So. Are these fresh, fresh issues that are now arising, or are they issues that are arising um, that weren't fully um, addressed at the time? Uh, I'm, I'm unclear on that uh, on that point. Um, and then finally, um, Lance, in your, when you spoke, you said that there's there's, an, that, that there's a board that um, essentially scrutinises the work that takes place within uh, at PAH. What, what, what was their feedback following the report? Because obviously they are, you know, they are the heads of scrutiny for, for, the, for the work that takes place within, within the hospital. So surely there's, there's some accountability there as well on, on, on them uh, for, for, um, for the findings within the report. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. So um, I'll respond to those in, uh, in order. So um, in terms of um, agency impact, so yes, um, we like all other organisations use um, uh, bank and agency staff to uh, to ensure that we can uh, complete and fill our rotors. Um, as Steph was, um, uh, was saying, we've got some really good recruitment plans in place. We've currently, our registered nursing vacancy rate is currently at around about 6%. Um, and as Steph said, we're aiming to get that down to 2% by the end of the financial uh, year. I think if you put into context, when I joined the organisation, about four and a half years ago, not that I'm taking any credit this at all, but when I joined in terms of the context four and a half years ago, uh, we had a 23% um, uh, vacancy rate for nursing colleagues. And so not only have we reduced that from 23% to 6%, but actually we've expanded the numbers of nursing posts um, as well. So that uh, so we have uh, been really successful over the last few years, particularly when uh, after we came out of quality special measures about three and a half years ago in terms of uh, really, really good recruitment into our registered nursing roles. Um, <clears throat> That, um, having said that, we still have a 6% uh, vacancy rate. And as I was uh, um, uh, alluding to and talking about earlier in terms of the way that we're managing COVID with separate um, uh, COVID ED to non-COVID ED or red to green EDs and same with ITU, that obviously puts extended uh, and expanded pressures onto, uh, onto colleagues as well. So, um, uh, so we're continuing to use uh, temporary staff to fill those gaps with really good recruitment plans. Um, in terms of Brexit, we haven't seen a noticeable impact of uh, Brexit at all. Um, uh, on uh, on our nursing colleagues. Um, in terms of the, uh, the your question about the changes, so um, so yes, we had some um, uh, some uh, significant um, uh, changes to implement from uh, CQC um, uh, visit from about five, four and a half to five well, about five and a bit years ago. Um, and uh, and in terms of the question about embedding, then yes, they have been embedded because we uh, we came out of quality special measures. Um, and we received a required improvement, and we continue to develop and expand our services uh, since then. I think there's always you know, the provision of healthcare is always dynamic um, and particularly when you look at the increase in demand that, uh, that Steph and I both uh, referred to earlier um, and uh, and you're constantly having to, uh, to to change and manage you know 20 percent or the best part of 20 percent increase in demand from two years ago puts a very very significant the different strain on uh, on a department it puts lots of different pressures on your physical uh, environment the management of covid itself in terms of ensuring that we have um, uh, safe spaces for our covid positive patients but also safe for those patients but also safe in terms of making sure that we don't have any nosocomial or patient to patient infections of covid um, completely changes the way that you work within the current building and within the current estate so th there's always the fluid management of patients uh, the, sorry fluid management of conditions and pathways um, and uh, and so um, as we were saying earlier there was nothing that the CQC um, uh, raised in their report that we weren't aware of um, and that we weren't actioning um, but um, in terms of were they different issues then yes they were different issues to the issues that we'd had before because we'd implemented those and sustained those and that enabled us to come out of um, uh, come out of special measures as I indicated uh, and in terms of oversight from the board so the, the trust board uh, as I think, uh, I think you might have even been to the trust board uh, meeting, but uh, before council, so um, a trust board meeting is a trust board is a unitary board. It's made up of um, uh, executive directors and our chair and non-executive directors, um, and uh, and then we work together in a unitary fashion to uh, to obviously uh, ensure that uh, ensure that um, we're you know we're uh, overseeing the quality of care that our patients receive as well as our financial um, uh, positions effectively and setting the strategy and the direction for the organisation. Um, so. Um, it's, in the same way that um, uh, the, the executive team were um, uh, knew what the issues were, the board were fully aware of all the issues that we're running with on a daily basis. So again, nothing was a surprise to the board. Um, but obviously, um, you know, we're disappointed that we're not providing the quality of care that we would like for all of our patients all of the time. Um, and that's why we've got such an energy and a focus on continuing to uh, improve all that we're doing. Thank you very much for that. Um, if I might just ask one final question. Um, after all the work that has been carried out by your staff in all areas of the hospital during the COVID, uh, which is obviously ongoing and for which we locally and nationally, we've all been extremely grateful for all that work. It must be very disappointing to receive a report like this and it must have an effect on the overall morale of staff. What can you, now in this situation do to ensure that you can raise that morale, that level of morale? Yeah, thank you. Um, and actually, 
Just before I answer that, can I also um, use this an opportunity to say a massive thank you to um, uh, to all of you, all your members, and importantly to um, all of the local population, because your help and support and uh, donations and kind words to all of our colleagues over the last uh, 20, 21 months has been fantastic, uh, really has been fantastic, and has been really, really appreciated um, by all of our colleagues. So uh, a massive, uh, mass massive thank you on behalf of uh, all my colleagues at PAH. Um, so, um, in impact on morale yes of course um, and yes of course because as Steph was saying all of our colleagues are absolutely dedicated to doing the best thing the right thing for all of our patients uh, all of the time so when you read a report that says uh, that maybe you're not doing uh, the best thing um, or the right thing all the time then obviously that is going to impact on morale particularly when um, uh, you know when uh, as uh, as mentioned earlier when uh, colleagues are exhausted and uh, and are tired um, actually, the response to the report has been really positive from all of our colleagues in terms of, um, okay, we can see that, we can understand that, um, and let's, uh, let's move forward and let's continue to implement. And this is where the strategy is really important as well. So let's continue to implement all the changes that we know and that we've agreed uh, in terms of the immediate actions, but also the medium to long-term actions to get us to the point of um, uh, delivering PHT 2030 or 10-year strategy and moving into the new hospital. Um, there's lots and lots of positivity about the IT solutions and the digital solutions that Steph referred to earlier, because all of our clinical colleagues know that that will be a massive difference both in terms of uh, the impact on their time on a day uh, on a moment to moment basis in terms of capturing patient information but also in terms of reducing the risk to uh, patients and improving therefore by definition improving the safety of care um, uh, that they're providing so there's a huge uh, that's a huge morale boost um, uh, in itself in terms of knowing that uh, certainly the, uh, the IT solution in the ED is, uh, is only months away from being uh, being introduced um, and the broader one for the organisation is just about to go through its, uh, its final approval stage. Uh, there's lots of um, um, uh, positive morale around the new hospital um, so we just need to get that over the line in terms of the, uh, the funding streams, um, but uh, but that will uh, that will continue to support that as well. And then some of the facilities that Steph was referring to earlier uh, that we're putting in place. So two weeks time, we're about to open a really a genuinely fantastic uh, space uh, for our staff uh, to rest in a really big rest area. Um, we've, um, as any of you who know the site and know the buildings well, um, they're. They're pretty poor buildings and we haven't had any uh, high quality rest facilities anywhere in the organization so that will open up and that will i'm sure will be a big morale booster um, and we've also um just uh, decommissioned a, a building uh, that, uh, that that we ran all our training and education uh, from as well and uh, and uh, i think it's just after Christmas, uh, just to get my girl for a nod, yes, uh, we'll just be about to open our new training, education and uh, development centre as well. So when colleagues do have um, a little bit of time away from being able to provide the clinical service and they're doing their mandatory training or they're doing their enhanced training to support to, to support uh, developing their skills, they'll be able to do it in a high quality environment. They'll be able to recognise that they're being you know, cared for and looked after uh, uh, well and appropriately. So lots of things that we're doing to maintain, uh, maintain the morale and um, but actually, on the whole, whilst colleagues are tired, um, they, uh, they recognise the need to continue to improve and are working really hard to do so. Thank you very much for that. Well, th and again, thank you very much for giving up your time this evening to come and talk to us and be, I use the word grilled. I, I hope you don't feel as if you've been grilled, but uh, it has been a very useful exercise, I think, on, from our point of view to hear and to get an understanding of what is happening uh, both with the CQC report and also obviously the way forward for the new hospital. So thank you again very much for coming along this evening, albeit by Zoom, but at least we have got this facility that does make this, uh, this possible for this evening. So thank you again. Um, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that brings the meeting to a close. We have no uh, any other business, no reason to exclude public and press. So thank you all very much for your attendance. It is the last meeting of Overview and Scrutiny before Christmas, so can I take this opportunity just to say I hope you all have a very happy Christmas and one which is not too affected by COVID this year. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.